Today on Alex and Autos, we are out here taking a look at the 2016 Ford Transit. Ford has been in the process of harmonizing their American and their European models for some time now, and this is one of the latest examples of that process. We're very familiar with Ford vans in the US, of course, with their E-Series in the past, and this will now be the new T-Series. Of course, the Transit is not a new vehicle by any stretch of the imagination. It has existed in Europe for a very, very long time. However, Americans have quite different tastes when it comes to cargo and passenger vans than in the rest of the world. So while in Europe you will find front-wheel drive and all-wheel drive versions of the Transit available, in the US it is rear-wheel drive only. Now if you're thinking to yourself this sounds like the same formula that Fiat and Chrysler used in order to bring us the Ram Promaster, you're half right. With the Ram Promaster what basically happened was they took a European vehicle and Americanized it and that means they changed as little as possible in order to bring it into the United States. They stuck a Ram nose on it but it definitely has a distinctly unusual look to it that we don't normally see in the United States. Of course it is again very familiar to other world markets. Now the Transit does not get a Ford pickup truck front end, it actually gets a massaged version of Ford's passenger car front end. So we get this attractive Ford grille right here with the horizontal bars, large Ford logo, definitely distinctive large headlamp modules over here. No van would be complete without options and there are an incredible variety in the Transit. I'm actually going to refer you over to the Ford web page if you want to configure yours and actually drill down into all the options that are possible. In a nutshell, there are three different lengths and three different heights available. Now at this moment, not every length is available in every height. So if you get the short wheelbase model, you cannot get the highest height. And if you get the long wheelbase model, you actually have to get the highest height model. Also worth noting is that the diesel engine is optional in this vehicle, but it is not available in the short wheelbase version. It's only available in medium and long. This variety of shapes and sizes is very similar to the Ram Promaster, but there are some big exceptions. We are of course taking a look at the passenger version of this, and there is no passenger version of the Ram Promaster at this time. That means that the model we're taking a look at right here really only competes with the Nissan NV and the General Motors set of vans. GM of course sells the same basic van as a Chevy or a GMC model. Now the Chevy and the GMC model are very traditional American vans and they haven't changed in quite a long time. So they only come in one roof height which is actually a little bit shorter than this although you can adjust the length on that van. Now the Nissan NV is sort of a Japanese take on an American cargo van. So it is very very truck like. It's based off their Nissan Titan pickup truck and we have a long hood up front because the engine is entirely under the hood. The Nissan does not come in all the flavors that we get in this Transit, however it does come in a factory high roof model and a passenger model as well. Out back we get relatively simple styling with these large tail lamp modules, it looks very very European back here. We get this bumper that looks different than your classic van bumper, it actually looks more similar to what we see in the Ram Promaster. The profile is relatively thin. Like the Ram, the Nissan, and the Mercedes vans, we get these large side doors that do latch into this place that's nearly parallel to the vehicle. We can also unlatch them and wrap them all the way around to this position. Now there's also an optional door that will go nearly parallel to the side of the vehicle when fully opened. Unlike the Ford E-Series vans or the General Motors vans, you won't find V8 engines under this hood. The base engine is a 3.7 liter V6 engine. It's mated to a six-speed automatic transmission, sending power to the rear wheels only. Again, that is a little bit different for other world markets for the Transit where there are front-wheel drive options available. Our particular engine is the optional 3.5 liter twin-turbo V6 engine that we see in a wide variety of other Ford models. Under this hood, it produces a little bit less power, however. It's only 310 horsepower and 400 pound-feet of torque. That's notably lower than the F-150. Also available in an interesting twist is a 3.2 liter inline five-cylinder turbo diesel that we're told is supposedly not related to the Volvo five-cylinder diesels. It produces 185 horsepower and 350 pound-feet of torque. All those engines are mated to that same six-speed automatic transmission. Fuel economy is notably better than the E-Series. It comes in at 14 miles per gallon city, 19 highway, and 16 combined for both of the V6 gasoline engines. There is no official number for the diesel because its gross combined weight is actually high enough that they don't have to report one, but I expect it to be in the mid to low 20s. Now an improvement of 3 miles per gallon over the E-Series may not sound like an awful lot, but when you do the math, that is actually a significant increase. In addition to there being no V8 engine under the hood, there is also no all-wheel drive option available in the Transit, even though that is available in certain world markets. Towing capacity comes in at 5,100 pounds for this wagon version, which places it above the Ram Promaster, but notably below the GM vans, which do have up to 10,000 pound tow ratings. Front seat comfort comes in at 8 out of 10 points. We do have the optional power adjustable driver's seat with the two-way adjustable lumbar support. Now this steering column 
tilts and telescopes, which is a nice twist in this segment. The one in the ProMaster telescopes, but it doesn't tilt, making it more difficult to find an ideal driving position. We also have an awful lot more range of adjustability than you'll find in GM's vans, which tilt but don't telescope. Personally, I find the seats in the Nissan Envy to be the most comfortable in this segment. I'm giving them 10 out of 10 points. They are very, very large and very, very comfortable. Now that said, the Nissan Envy seats are no more adjustable than this, so it really does depend on your body shape. I think that the Mercedes-Benz Sprinter comes in a little bit above this, but the difference is actually quite close. Rear seat comfort is very good for this segment. These rear seats have a recline feature, which is a little interesting because each module reclines independently of another. So I can actually recline that module right there, I can scoot on over to this other one, and this one is in its upright position. And this one, again, also reclines independently of the third one that is all the way on the left of the vehicle. That same thing also happens back here in the third row where these seats are all independently reclinable as well. Another nice touch is that the seat belts actually come out of the seats themselves. They don't dangle out of the ceiling, so you're not tripping over them to get from one row into the other. You should know that there aren't a lot of armrests to go around, so we only get an armrest right here on this seat in our eight passenger model. The other passengers do have to make do with the hard walls of the vehicle. Well, the Nissan van comes only as a 12 passenger van and the GM vans are a choice between 12 or 15, there's more variety going on right here in the Ford. It comes in either eight, 10, 12, or 15 passenger versions, which means that you don't have to waste money buying a 12 or 15 passenger van if you're gonna throw out that last row so you have increased cargo capacity. That means that if you're using this as a family vehicle or some sort of transport shuttle type vehicle, you don't have to put those seats somewhere or just worry about ditching them. You can actually buy the van without them in the first place. Now on the downside, these seat modules are not quite as handy as we find in the Nissan NV because the NV uses seat modules of either one seat or two seats and these modules are either three seats or four seats. That means they're much bigger and they're heavier and they take more people to get them in and out of the vehicle. Obviously the score is 10 out of 10 points when it comes to my exclusive trunk comfort index because this cargo area is enormous. You can actually get an eight passenger version that's suited for eight passengers worth of cargo right from the factory. And of course this is the low roof version and there are two different roof heights above this. Let's take a quick look around the interior. You'll notice that in the rear, we only have a few cup holders. They're actually really only there on the walls of the vehicle. We don't have individual cup holders for all of these eight seating positions that are in this vehicle. That does make it a little bit trickier to use this as more of a family type vehicle. Again, those shoulder belts are integrated into each of the seat modules and they do recline independently of one another. There is of course a separate climate control module for the rear and we have air vents that run down the ceiling like that for the rear passengers. Now the only controls that you'll find for the rear air conditioning and heating system are right up here in the front of the vehicle. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable seat belts and height adjustable headrests. These seats are vinyl, not leather, and they are perforated in the middle to help breathe a little bit better. Now moving on down here to the armrest, this is a ratchet style armrest for the driver and front passenger ratchets into position like that. You have to lift it all the way up for it to return to the bottom position and ratchet again. Like the ProMaster, the windows are in unusual shape and that allows this side view mirror right here to actually be positioned lower in the vehicle to give you a better view of the side and the rear of the vehicle. Moving down from that, the door panel itself is made of entirely hard touch plastic, so no soft touch armrests on the outsides of the vehicle. We do have window and door controls that are very familiar to you if you've driven other Ford products. We also have a storage cubby right down there on the bottom of that door panel. Ford really went crazy with the cup holders and storage up front. So we have a cup holder right there on that side of the dashboard. We also have a slot below that that you can put bottles or other items in. We do have a relatively small glove compartment for a vehicle of this size. I was able to put a tablet computer inside, but it's not as large as you'll see in some. Moving over to the center of the dashboard, we have an awful lot of style and parts that are shared with other Ford vehicles. We have this touchscreen infotainment and navigation system in our particular model. This is actually quite unique in this particular segment because not every vehicle is available with a touchscreen nav system. And if we take a look at options like the Nissan Envy, it actually uses one of their cheapest infotainment and navigation systems. And this is basically the same as you'll find in every Ford and Lincoln model. This is a card holder right here, so you can actually put parking tickets or credit cards right in there. Then we have the buttons for that system. Volume knob right there, display button, tune up, down, source, seek forward, backward, sound button right there. We have a traditional console shifter that is borrowed essentially from other Ford models as well. We have a manual mode all the way at the bottom and then we use the buttons right there on the side of the shifter. Above that we have actually quite an interesting little cubby right there. It actually holds a smartphone right like that. I actually find that to be an incredibly handy feature because if you're using your smartphone to navigate from, it's actually quite close to the driver. Over on this side, we have our single zone manual climate control for the front, and then we have another zone for the rear with those controls I showed you earlier. 
Below all of that, we have more storage going on right here. We have a 12 volt power outlet, small storage cubby right there, two very large cup holders, and then some change holders on this side. Now you notice we have some interesting little cutouts in this area, and that's because in other world markets and in other versions of the vehicle, we actually have a single USB port and a single auxiliary input there. For our vehicle with this touchscreen nav system, our inputs are lower in the dash. Moving all the way to the floor, we have a storage bin right under there like that. And then between the two, we'll actually find our auxiliary inputs right over here, SD card and two USB ports. The instrument cluster is similar to what we see in other Ford models. We have physical dials for our speed, our tachometer, our fuel level, and our engine temperature. And then everything else is displayed in that small multifunction LCD in between the two. The Transit uses basically a passenger car steering wheel, which means it's a little bit narrower than most of the other cargo vans. Some people may prefer that, some people may not. On this side of the steering wheel, we have the buttons that control that multifunction LCD right there. We have our cruise control buttons below that. On this side, we have a voice command button, home button, phone hang up, pickup button, and an information button for that My Ford Touch system in there, mute button, track forward, backward, and volume up, down. The Transit also uses turn signal and windshield wiper stocks from the passenger car vehicles. We push the button at the end there for our lane departure warning system. Over on the driver's side, we have yet more storage with another cup holder there to the left of the driver and another storage bin right there under the headlamp controls. Braking and acceleration tests in a full-size van may sound ridiculous, but this is Alex and Autos, and we take our journalism very seriously. And that's why we also bring you that exclusive trunk comfort index. And what better thing to 0 to 60 or 60 to 0 test than a full-size passenger van? We are driving the twin turbo model of the Transit, and this scooted from 0 to 60 in a very impressive 7.1 seconds. You'll note that that is actually about the same speed as the much larger and much thirstier Nissan NV with that large V8 engine. It's also notably faster than any version of the GM van. Therefore, this van does get top honors with an A plus when it comes to acceleration. Now, I have to admit that I would like to see all wheel drive for a variety of different reasons, and performance is one of them, because you can get a little bit of wheel slip in the back. When it comes to braking, obviously full-size vans and pickup trucks will take an awful lot longer to stop than your average passenger car. This came in at 147 feet, which is significantly longer than any minivan that I have ever tested. Obviously, driving a van like this requires a slightly different set of instincts out of people. I'm actually going to give this a B when it comes to braking, because certain versions of GM's cargo vans and passenger vans do break shorter than this because they have wider tires. Slightly narrower tires and lighter curb weight are the ways that this and the Ram Promaster are getting their excellent fuel economy. When it comes to handling, I'm going to give this an A. The Transit actually surprised me a little bit. We get a little bit of steering feel out of the front of the vehicle. This is a rear wheel drive vehicle, so you know, if you cared about driving dynamics in your full-size cargo or passenger van, then this would be the van for you versus that Promaster because it's front wheel drive, this one's rear wheel drive. Uh, we also have this twin turbo engine, so you actually can get this to feel a little bit lively at the right moments. Now, I might actually say that those are the wrong moments because you probably shouldn't be doing that in a full-size van, uh, but it is possible and more possible than you'll find in the competition. The big difference is how confident this feels out on the road. This feels an awful lot more nimble. It drives an awful lot smaller than GM's full-size van or the Nissan full-size van. When it comes to the ride, I'm going to give this an A-. minus. I would prefer a slightly more plush ride, but this is actually fairly good for a large passenger van. Out on gravel roads like we're on right here, the Transit rides relatively well, and that actually surprised me a little bit as well. A lot of cargo vans or passenger vans, when they're designed to hold a maximum of passengers and cargo, get pretty stiff. Now, I will say that out on gravel roads like this, this is where I am a little bit sad that there's no optional all-wheel drive in the Transit. You'll note that that was one of the major things that changed in the Sprinter recently, is the availability of one of Mercedes' best all-wheel drive systems. Cabin noise came in at 72 decibels, which means this is very similar to your average comp Pakistan. I actually found that fairly impressive. GM's cargo vans are louder because the engine is right down here in the center of the dashboard, basically, right next to my right foot. And that means that there's an awful lot more engine noise coming into the cabin. Fuel economy has been a hair disappointing. I've been averaging 15.2 miles per gallon commuting in this vehicle, and I have been driving solo for most of this week with very little cargo in the back. The Ram Promaster will give you better fuel economy in real-world driving situations. It is quite light, and of course it is front-wheel drive, which helps improve economy as well. But this is significantly better than the GM and enormously better than the Nissan. The Nissan with the V8 engine that gives you this kind of performance really, really drinks gas. The most fuel-efficient version, of course, would be the 3.2-liter turbo diesel in this model, and I think that's actually quite a tasty option since it does use a traditional automatic transmission, not a single-clutch robotic shifted manual transmission like we find in the Promaster. 
The most interesting thing about driving this Transit really is how car-like the Transit feels out on the road. The Promaster can feel kind of like a bus. It's a combination of the steering wheel positioning. It's, it's almost horizontal like a bus. It's big. It has a big steering wheel. And the whole van just feels a little bit Euro funky. This actually feels kind of like I'm driving a Ford Focus. Of course, that would be a Ford Focus that has put on an incredible amount of weight. But in general, this does feel more car-like than the other vans out there. The incredible low-end torque we get out of this twin turbocharged engine really is a very unique feature about this van, because the torque that we get out of this engine is not that far off of most turbo diesel engines out there. It's about 400 pound-feet of torque. That's an awful lot of torque at very, very low usable RPMs. It means that when you're hill climbing in this van, the transmission doesn't really have to downshift to help you up the hill. This van never feels out of breath like the last generation Ford van always did when hill climbing. When it comes to pricing, we'll be focusing mainly on the wagon version, which is what we've been testing right here. It starts at $33,175, and that actually surprised me because it's not a very large increase over the GM vans. The GM vans are quite old at this point, and they start around $32,900. Nissan's Envy is the least expensive option for passenger carrying at just under this $32,810. Now, all three of those vehicles are considerably less expensive than the Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. The Sprinter is really in a category all of its own. On the cargo van side, the same thing is true. The Ram, the Ford, the Nissan, and the General Motors vans are all very close to one another in terms of pricing, and they're all considerably less than that Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. GM's vans are getting particularly old lately. At this point, for the passenger versions, there's only a 4.8 liter V8 engine or a 6.6 liter V8 turbo diesel. Now, the diesel's going after a very different market than the diesel in this Transit. The Transit is trying to give you the maximum fuel economy for average driving conditions without towing being in mind. Again, towing comes in right around 5,000 pounds maximum for the wagon version of the Transit. However, towing does come in at about 10,000 pounds maximum on that GM van. So if you do plan on putting passengers and cargo in the vehicle and then towing a big heavy trailer, the GM1 is really going to be your only option. In basically every other area, however, the GM is really starting to show its age. The fuel economy isn't as good as this in real world situations. The interior is not nearly as comfortable as the Transit either. The Transit also has factory high roof options. We get those three different roof heights to choose from, which make it an awful lot easier to get in and out of the vehicle. Space efficiency is also in the Transit's favor. Because this engine bay was not designed for a big 6.6 liter V8 engine, it was only designed for those V6 engines, we get a lot more footwell room up front than we do in the GM van. You're also not cooking your right leg when you're driving the vehicle. We also have more features available on this interior. All the seats recline in the cabin, we get that touchscreen navigation system, which is very well done, much better than anything we find over there in the GM vans, and everything just looks more modern inside the Transit. The interior is a major differentiator when it comes to passenger vans, because the GM vans, again, are quite old. And the Nissan and the Ford vans have side curtain airbags, we also have headrests to help reduce whiplash injuries in the back. Another very nice touch in both the Nissan and the Ford vans is that we get shoulder belts that actually come out of the seats themselves. They're not coming out of the ceiling or some other place in the vehicle where you could trip over them when you're getting from one row into the other. The Nissan can be a little bit of a problem to park because it has that very long hood that comes out of the front. Again, it looks more like a pickup truck with a large box grafted on the back. That means it's very easy to work on its V8 engine under the hood. However, it does mean its hood is much longer, and it means that it takes up much more parking lot room. Basically, all the Nissan NV vans that are out there are as long as the longest wheelbase GM van, but you actually get less interior space between the seat backs and the back of the cargo area because the vehicle overall isn't as efficient. Of course, the Nissan is rated for higher towing capacity than the Transit, but it's not as high as that GM van. Now, the biggest difference between this and the Nissan van really comes down to handling and fuel efficiency. This vehicle handles considerably better than the Nissan NV van, and the fuel efficiency is markedly better. The last Nissan NV van I had, I had troubles getting double digit fuel economy out of it. That large V8 engine is a very lovely engine. It sounds incredible, but it is also incredibly thirsty. Ford's 3.2 liter turbo diesel engine is a very tasty option for a variety of different reasons. We do get that improved fuel economy, which is significantly better than the gasoline engines. It also has a lot of low end torque, which really helps if you're loaded up and you're climbing a hill. The option of the diesel is under $6,000, and that is thousands less than the GM turbo diesel. 
course, the mission of this turbo diesel and the one over there in the GM is different. This one is trying to give you maximum fuel economy. The one over there in the GM is trying to really give you maximum towing ability. Now, Ram also offers a small turbo diesel in the ProMaster on the cargo side, but it's a very different beast as well because that small turbo diesel engine over there in the ProMaster is mated to a single clutch automated manual transmission, and this uses a traditional six speed automatic. The ProMaster's six speed single clutch transmission has to have a very, very low first gear so that you can actually get moving up a hill. But it means that gear changes are very rough, they take a long time, and it does not feel like a traditional automatic at all. It actually feels like someone driving a regular old manual transmission and shifting relatively slowly. That's not going on in this. It feels like a very traditional diesel pickup truck with a diesel that's perhaps a little bit smaller and a little bit less powerful than you're used to. In general, the Mercedes interior is a slightly nicer place to spend your time than the Transit. However, the difference between the two is much smaller than the price difference between the two. Now, going back to the cargo side for a moment so we can compare this to the Ram ProMaster, the distinct advantage on the ProMaster is the load floor height. You can see right here there's actually a one step up into the inside of the vehicle, and you don't have that in the ProMaster. The load floor is actually right down here about this lower step's height. That's all made possible by the front-wheel drive nature of the ProMaster. Everything that is the ProMaster that is moving it along the road is all under the front seats or under the hood of the vehicle. That means that the load floor can be slammed as low as possible to the ground, and it means a load height that is significantly lower than any of the other cargo vans in the US. Now obviously if you need to be able to tow a little bit more than that ProMaster or you're looking for something that's rear wheel drive or a more powerful engine, then I would get the Transit over the ProMaster. I'd also get the diesel in this over the diesel in the ProMaster, and it's all down to the transmission. When I was last driving a ProMaster with the diesel engine, it had troubles with the steep hills around me. The vehicle would start out in first gear, and then it would be unable to shift to second gear because the hill was too steep and it slowed down too much during that shift process. That's not going on in the automatic transmission version of this because it is a traditional six-speed auto. GM is also giving some extremely large fleet incentives right now, so if purchase price is your only consideration, the GM may seem like a good option. However, the Transit really excels in basically every way over that GM cargo van, with the exception of that large turbo diesel engine. If you do need to tow 10,000 pounds with your passenger van or with your cargo van, it's basically the only option out there. There are also easy aftermarket modifications that you can do to that van in order to give it all-wheel drive. However, if you're looking for a passenger van like we are looking at right here, in my mind, there's really very little reason to buy the GM van. You will actually make up the difference in terms of improved fuel economy in this. The passenger compartment is much more comfortable. We get that high roof option, which is very, very attractive. And of course, you can get the 3.5 liter twin turbo V6, which is an awful lot of fun. I'd also rank this over the Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. It's less expensive. We also get that twin turbo V6 engine that I mentioned earlier. The biggest thing for me, however, with the Mercedes is just the price. It is an awful lot of a premium to pay for that Mercedes logo on the front. Thanks for watching this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2016 Ford Transit. Be sure and check out those related videos down there on the bottom of your screen. Like this video, comment on this video, tell me what you think about the 2016 Ford Transit, and I'll see you next week.